Frustration is a good thing in business. When you're professionally frustrated, you're subconsciously telling yourself that you're not happy doing what you're doing. Um, and there's no point in working if all you're doing is working to make money. Uh, you need to find your passion. You, you need to find your, your raison d'etre or, or the reason you were put on this earth professionally. What was it? What were you put here to accomplish? Uh, frustration basically makes you reassess where you are in life professionally. And it forces you down another path to find a career or uh, that, that you'll enjoy. And so frustration leads to breakthrough. Frustration leads to reinvention. Welcome to the new you. I want to talk a little bit about Derek Jeter. Uh, my son is a, um, a big Yankees fan. Um, I'm a big Toronto Blue Jays fan. He's a Yankees fan only because he was born in New York City. Uh, the Yankees are big rivals to my Toronto Blue Jays. Um, but I'm cool with him liking Derek Jeter because Derek Jeter is an amazing role model. Um, he's amazing. Uh, and so for those of you that are not familiar with Derek Jeter, he's one of the, the best baseball players of, of this current era. And the reason Jeter was very successful is quite simply not just because of his athletic abilities or the fact he was very confident, but his parents from a very young age made him do something. They made him write down his goals every year, every year from a very young age. Uh, and his goals, he had to write down 10 goals on a piece of paper and submit it to his parents. It was called a, a contract. And I do this with my kids now too. Uh, and basically, this contract is pretty simplistic. Um, and it's something along these lines. I will only, I will only get A's and B's in my courses. Uh, I will do my chores. I will clean up my room. Uh, I will practice baseball. I will be respectful to my parents. Uh, I, I will go to church with my family, et cetera, whatever it might be. Uh, but... Goal setting can change your life. And I want to mention a fascinating study which occurred uh, back in the 1950s and 70s. 1952, Yale University. They took a poll. They asked all of the graduating class of 1952 how many of them had written down their goals on a piece of paper. And only 3% had. And then 20 years later, or 30 years later, was it 30 years no, it was 20 years later. 20 years later, in 1972, they went back to the same graduating class. And they asked the graduating class um, what their net worth was. And the net worth of the 3% that had written down their goals was greater than the other 97% combined. Now, I'm not saying that making a lot of money is a measure of happiness or success, but you can quantify it. And so I can't stress how important it is for you and for me and for all of us to write down our goals every year. Write down your goals. Sharpen the saw. Um, Reevaluate where you are in life. Uh, and if you're frustrated, then use these goals as kind of a roadmap to get you out of frustration. Tech innovation thrives in the United States due to youth with confidence. We kind of covered this earlier on, but I want to revisit it quickly. Um, and I'm not saying that um, innovators uh, from America are better than innovators from everywhere else, in the, everywhere else in the world. It's not true. In fact, most successful entrepreneurs in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, in the tech industry were born overseas. 60% of entrepreneurs in the Bay Area were born overseas. And what happens is, you know, it, it, I remember when I was a kid reading about America and hearing that American students, whether or not they were born in this country, are 50th in the world in math or 50th in the world in sciences. But American students, uh, and I can really vouch for this because I'm a professor at a couple of Bay Area schools, American students, whether or not they were born in this country, are number one in the world in confidence. And confidence is the most important economic indicator that nobody talks about, in my humble opinion. And with confidence comes the ability to sell, sell a dream, sell a vision. Uh, be optimistic, uh, change the world, change the industry, putting a dent in the universe. I want to quickly also talk about Amazon Web Services because it's the most important tectonic technology shift or platform in the world today. Uh, and it's going to be very important to all of us from an investment perspective, whether or not you invest in technology companies or not. It's important. You all use Amazon Web Services. You just don't know it. And so before I go into AWS or Amazon Web Services, I'm going to talk about platforms. The best investments in history uh, are the ones where you can invest in platforms. What do I mean by that? Well, if you own the roads, you charge the cars. 
in the tool booths. What are platforms and technology? Microsoft Windows was a great platform, right? Microsoft owned the road and charged the companies that ran software products on top of Windows. Um, and other recent uh, examples of this are eBay, which is the quintessential auction platform. Uh, Facebook is the best social media platform. Uh, YouTube is an incredible uh, video platform. And Amazon has got the best platform in all of technology today. What does this mean? Well, when we think of Amazon, we think of the consumer products company where we order stuff online. And they have great customer service. But the reason Amazon has a high valuation today is because of something called Amazon Web Services. What is that? Well, in 2005, around the holiday season, the amazing founder and CEO of Amazon, Jeff Bezos, he decided that he can't handle all the traffic, people coming to Amazon.com to order presents. And so what he did was he did something amazing. He created nine big buildings around the country, right? And he put millions of servers, right, or computers in each one of these buildings. And he turned them on around the holiday season. And he's able to take on all this excess traffic, right, uh, for people ordering presents online. And then something happened. Every January, he had all this excess capacity left over. What's he going to do with it? He did something amazing. <laughs> he started renting it out. He started renting out to companies, right, at a low price. And he kept cutting the pricing point. And he kept cutting it and cutting it and cutting it and cutting it. And he's cut the pricing point on Amazon Web Services as a platform 50 times since uh, 2005. And to put it into context, Microsoft, which was a monopoly um, in the 80s and 90s, until recently, Microsoft only cut the pricing point on Windows three times, going back to the 1980s. And so what's happened is Amazon has basically disrupted the entire software uh, ecosystem. Uh, I'm a firm believer that Microsoft had to let their CEO go because of Amazon. Amazon was focused on cloud computing. And one of the reasons that Microsoft has not been successful recently is because they didn't really focus enough on cloud computing. Now, the new CEO of Microsoft is a guy named Satya Nadella, and he was the head of their cloud division, and he is the right choice to be running that company today. So let's talk a little bit more about Amazon Web Services. You all use it, you just don't know it. So every company in the Valley that matters, you know, runs their company off of Amazon Web Services. Uber, you know, is able to have an incredible service because Amazon Web Services is ubiquitous, it's everywhere, and it's cheap. Um, Airbnb exists and it's relevant and it's disrupting the hotel industry globally because it runs on Amazon Web Services. Netflix, until recently, was the biggest customer of Amazon. Uh, Netflix runs entirely on Amazon Web Services, right? That's why Netflix offers an incredible service at a low pricing point, uh, below 10 bucks per month in, in most geographies um, because it runs on Amazon Web Services, which is really cheap. Uh, and now the biggest customer of Amazon Web Services is Dropbox. And many of us, many of us use it. Just It's a way for you to store files online. And the amazing thing about Dropbox is that Dropbox charges about 10 bucks a month per terabyte of usage, right, for corporations. And Amazon only charges Dropbox a penny per month for that terabyte. And you know what? Amazon is incredibly profitable on that one penny. That's the power of scale. So Amazon's an amazing company. In fact, remember earlier in this course, I talked about how Alan Greenspan came and presented to us when I worked at Citadel. And Greenspan basically spoke about how you had a great deflationary environment in this country uh, and globally uh, in, in the late 80s, early 90s. You had amazing robust growth in the 90s because the Berlin Wall fell and you had all this very intelligent and capable um, high quality labor from Eastern Europe moving west. And the biggest input into inflation is labor. Well, I believe that Amazon Web Services is this generation's Berlin Wall teardown deflationary event. Let's talk about founders. When a company founder resigns, investors should head for the exit too. When all the founders leave, you got to run for the exits. Why? Because bureaucracy sets in, right? So only the founder has the chutzpah or the guts. Uh, to change um, uh, an entire marketplace, to disrupt an ecosystem, to put a dent in the universe. When a founder leaves a company, bureaucracy sets in. 
right? And so I have a lot of friends that work for very large technology companies here in the Bay Area. I won't tell you which ones they are. Uh, but I ask my friends, I say, why can't your company innovate? Why do they keep buying growth? Why can't they create cool stuff internally? Why is it that Microsoft spends $10 billion a year in R&D and all I have to show for it is Connect or other cool stuff, whatever? And the reasons uh, include the fact that the founder is gone. And, and people at these large tech companies, I'm not singling out Microsoft at all, but other tech companies, people that work at other tech companies, if you're an executive climbing the ladder, right, all you care about is climbing the corporate ladder. You're not going to innovate because if you innovate and you're not successful, you're done, man. You no longer climb the corporate ladder. But if you are successful when you innovate within a, a firm like that, a big firm, you're not going to get paid anyway because they don't want to disrupt the entire C-level or senior management level compensation structure. And so the moral hazard is you quit. You go to a startup. Uh, you raise money from venture capital firms, et cetera. And so you might say, Chris, wait a second. Big companies can innovate. What about Amazon? What about Google? What about Salesforce? Well, those three companies are great companies, and I'd love to invest in them because the founder is still there. And so Mark Benioff has a very positive attitude, and there's no bureaucracy or very little at Salesforce. If you look at Larry and Sergey, they're basically running the show at Google. And one out of every five days, or 20% of your time uh, per week, uh, you're allowed as an engineer at Google to work on a pet project which has created amazing innovation coming out of that company. And Jeff Bezos has that awesome rule that no meeting is allowed to take place at Amazon uh, where you require more than two pizzas to feed people. It's called the two pizza rule. So you don't have that many cooks in the kitchen. So Amazon actually operates like a small company. But when a company founder resigns or when all the founders resign, uh, resign uh, investors really need to head for the exit too. You need Yodas in order to succeed in business and in life. Yodas. Yoda is a, a euphemism for uh, a mentor. And you have to have multiple mentors. And you want to only ask people that are successful uh, for advice. And people are very flattered when you ask them uh, to be your mentor. They almost always say yes. And the most important mentor uh, or Yoda you have in your life is, is your, your spouse. Uh, and I look at my wife, Christine, and, um, and she's one of my, my greatest Yodas or mentors. Now, she can tell me if I'm dressed like I have fashion from the 80s or, or if uh, the tone of my emails uh, isn't correct. Uh, you got to listen to them. Uh, they'll mentor you and they'll help you out a lot. Uh, and also, what, what I would say is you need to mentor other people because it really helps you to not only help them grow professionally, which is a good thing to do from a comrade perspective, but it also helps you to reinforce your core beliefs when you mentor other people, right? It makes you um, a better investor, a better, better business person, a better person, period, by reinforcing what you really believe in and explaining by mentoring others uh, what your core values are. You need Yodas in order to succeed in business and life, and you need many of them. When to change careers. This one's important. I love this one. So I've said this a couple of times, and I'm going to say it again. If you get out of bed in the morning and you tell yourself you're going to work today, you're doing it wrong. You need to change careers right away. You need to find out what you're passionate about in life. What is the reason you were put on this earth uh, to do professionally? What is your raison d'être? What drives you? What do you enjoy? Don't ever do anything for money. Do it because you love it. And I promise you, the money will always come. Okay, so it's very important when you're frustrated professionally to change careers. Okay, keep reinventing yourself. And the best way to do this, to change careers, is by networking. And we've covered this several times in this course. Use LinkedIn. Set up informational meetings. Talk to as many people as you can in the industries or companies you want to work at. And get advice from them. Ask for help. Remember, the Steve Jobs video. Search for Steve Jobs Ask in YouTube. Ask and you shall receive. And keep asking people that work at companies you want to work at um, for help on how to change careers. I've done this several times. I was miserable in a couple of industries I worked in, including the hedge fund industry, which I hated because it was very short-term focused. And I reinvented myself and got into the venture capital industry, which I love. I don't have a job now. I have a passion. So let's do this. Now... I want to finish off this course um, with a session 
And I want you to please, please, please do me the favor of doing this. I want you to please write down your 10 business goals right now, okay, for the next 10 years. And I don't want you to uh, be conservative, okay? I want you to think outside the box and be very aggressive, okay? And set your goals very high, very high. And remember we talked about the Yale study? Um, if you write down your goals, the percent chance of you achieving these goals is very, very, very high, okay? Please pause this right now and write down your 10 goals you're going to achieve in the next 10 years, and then come back to me. Okay. I hope you worked on your goals. I trust you then. So you're going to embark upon an amazing journey over the next decade to achieve your business uh, goals. And I want to talk about this for a second because you're going to get to a point where you're working on achieving a goal. And when you first set out a business goal, you can see the top of the mountain. Okay, And that's a, a, an analogy for, uh, for your goal. There's the top of the mountain. Okay, I've got 10 years to achieve that goal. And you're gonna start walking closer to the mountain. And you're getting closer, you're getting closer, you're getting closer, and it's awesome. A couple of years into it, you're getting closer to your goal, okay? But you're gonna reach a point where you can't see the top of the mountain anymore, and you become disillusioned, and you start deviating, your pace slows, and you start zigzagging. And I want you to remember that the reason you can't see the top of the mountain anymore is because you're halfway up the mountain and you just can't see it. But I promise you, you're getting closer to it. Please write down all of your goals and update them at least every year and carry them with you in your pocket uh, or on your, your PDA or whatever it is. Like what I do is I actually write down my goals uh, in the calendar section on my iPhone. And I repeat that calendar entry, which I put as private because I don't want other people in my company seeing it. But I repeat that entry daily. So I see it every morning, goals. Update your goals often, and I promise you, you'll achieve them. You'll surprise yourself. Ask, and you shall receive. So I want to finish off this course by thanking you again. But I want to finish it off with what I first started talking about in the first class, um, which was the three qualities that the best entrepreneurs have. They're incredibly passionate. Uh, they're very optimistic, and they believe that David always beats Goliath. There are small companies or small groups of people can always beat big companies. Be incredibly passionate about whatever it is you do or are going to do. Uh, I want you to also, you know, just repeat that quote to yourself that Confucius said, which is, find an occupation you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Okay. I want you to be optimistic, incredibly optimistic, and hang out with people that are very optimistic as well. You can achieve anything you want to in life if you set your mind to it. Whether or not you think you can achieve something, you're right. Positive attitude works. And lastly, just remember that small companies win. Small companies can change the world. Please, please, please do what you're most passionate about in life. Thank you very much for your time and for your commitment.